its kind. No more will be produced. Some final engine tests on Friday, then wheeled away to what future no one knows. The government says plainly that a nation of 17 million can't afford to spend the bulk of its defense budget on planes of doubtful strategic value. You know, I know it's not the USA. The USA could have certainly kept it going with its size and the money and the, and the taxes paid. It, 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 but I, I would say, yes, it could, and it should have by George, because it had the finest thing on earth, and that's worth spending a few bucks uh, on when you get the very, very best. Well, it wasn't an exceptionally wonderful plane. It was a big plane, but it was essentially a, a plane that could have been built and designed and built on the basis of data that was available at that time. And many aircraft were, were like this. There was nothing extraordinary about it, so I think that supposition is rather, rather naive and misguided. Once, a relation soared up there in the stratosphere, linked to this sleek needle in the sky. Canadian designed, Canadian built, a bold statement of our national power and pride. But what you are seeing here is one of the few things about the Arrow that everyone can agree on. There was such a plane, it flew, however briefly, and it was a beauty to behold before it was killed. Almost 40 years later, everything else in the Arrow story is still so full of debate and emotion, it's hard to measure what is real and what is not. Here at the National Aviation Museum in Ottawa is about all that's left of the Arrow, and it's this cockpit section here, behind me. Everything else has vanished, and that's what feeds the mystique of this aircraft. Only five arrows flew before the project was cancelled in 1959. All were cut up and destroyed, except for this ghostly shell now on display. But the arrow story has never gone away or grown stale. Morning. Morning. All right. We know it works on paper. Now we step into the unknown. Arrow 201, this is tower. Do you read? This four-hour mini-series, just shown on television, is merely the latest examination of Canada's fascination with the arrow. The issues the arrow triggered four decades ago are still alive today. How good was our technology? Who really killed the arrow? And what died along with the plane? The keepers of the arrow flame over the years and this TV movie argue that the arrow, designed and built entirely here in Canada, would have been the finest, most sophisticated jet interceptor in the world. Arrow skeptics argue that the plane was overrated and its test data fudged, and it was at best not spectacular, at worst ordinary. Julius Lukasiewicz, a professor of aerospace engineering at Carleton University. Well, I don't see that it was any different than any other such aircraft in, in, the, in those days. It was big. I mean, that, that is true. It was a rather large aircraft, bigger than, um, than any fighter aircraft, I think, that flew at that time. But other than this, when people say it was a head, they never tell you what, what, what was the advantage of that aircraft. I mean, as far as speed, there was no advantage. There were aircraft that flew uh, faster in the same year. So Mach number two, which it attained just about Mach number two, that was nothing extraordinary to this. So what was extraordinary? I, I don't know what was extraordinary. I don't think anything was particularly extraordinary. We'll never really know how good the Arrow would have been. The test models never flew with the final Arrow engine, the Iroquois, which was still being developed. But even if its flight performance turned out to be exceptional, its effectiveness as a weapon is in doubt. Historian Jack Granitstein says the Arrow was designed to shoot down Soviet bombers and was no longer critical in the age of missiles. The day the Arrow was rolled out for its first public viewing was the day the Soviets put up their first Sputnik. The world was just about to move from, as people believed, from the era of the manned bomber to the era of the intercontinental ballistic missile. The Arrow was not going to be in squadron service in Canada until about 1962. And in 1958, looking ahead four years, looking at that strategic environment that was changing from bombers to missiles, did it make sense to sink so much money into a single weapon system that conceivably might be obsolete 
before it ever got off the ground in squadron service. We have touched down. <laughs> A point the movie downplays was the nature of the Arrows mission. This all-Canadian plane was designed to launch nuclear-tipped American missiles. Diefenbaker Baker and company, who later got very unhappy about nuclear weapons around 1962 and 63, they, they, as a matter of course, accepted the idea that Canada would take nuclear weapons from the United States for the Arrow, for the Bullmark that uh, eventually replaced it, for our troops in Europe, for our Navy, for our Air Force in Europe. Everyone was going to have nukes. The Avro Arrow has become a multi-million dollar make-work project. You really don't understand, do you? You know, it's politicians like you who would keep this country from greatness. If you have no respect for me, have respect for my office. I am the Prime Minister of Canada. And I demand that you personally Who killed the Arrow? The movie fingers, two suspects, the Arrow itself. Its development costs were going through the roof, from $2 million a plane to an estimated $12.5 million. To make it, the Arrow needed foreign buyers, Despite the impression left by the movie, none appeared by the time the project was killed. The technical excellence of 105, or otherwise, is in a sense beside the point. That is not the reason to have it or not to have it. The reasons are those that I mentioned, like you have to have a viable market, internal market, because it has to be internal because people will not buy it from you for the same reason that you want to develop it yourself. They say we must have our own. So you must have that uh, internal market and you must be able to pay for development of that aircraft uh, unless you have a large market. Does the president have his mosquito lotion? It's okay, he borrowed some from the prime minister. And the second suspect in the Arrow's death the Americans. The movie depicts President Dwight Eisenhower pressuring Prime Minister John Diefenbaker into abandoning the Arrow idea and buying American missiles. Have you thought about that defensive missile system we offered you? The Bomark missiles? I'd buy them from you, Ike, but $200 million. That new fighter interceptor jet, the Arrow, has our defense over budget as it is. We could trade you some of those for the missiles. A fighter jet? No. Oh. Where the Americans the villains? Program. Professor Jack Granitstein. There's no doubt uh, that the American aircraft industry would have been exceedingly unhappy if uh, the U.S. had bought aircraft from Canada. I mean, that would mean jobs in California and uh, the Northeast, so they would be exceedingly unhappy. But to say that the Americans killed it is, I think, simply not true, because, in fact, the Secretary of the Air Force in 1958 told the Canadian ambassador that if Canada wanted, the Americans would buy arrows and give them to the RCAF. In other words, to try to keep production going, the Americans would actually give us some of our own aircraft. The, the Canadian ambassador, however, thought this was charity and said Canada had never accepted aid and this wouldn't fly. To paint the Americans as the villains in this really requires that you believe in a conspiracy thesis. This is restricted airspace, you know, I could lose my life. Right, right on the top! But what feeds the conspiracy theory is the government's ordering the destruction not only of the arrows, but of all the plans and technical data. It still seems, even after all this time, inexplicable. Elwi Yost who worked for Avro at the time, recruited many of the Arrow's engineers. This business of having all those planes destroyed, because as long as I live, I'll still smell the acetylene torches in the bays as I walk through those bays, uh, the torches that were used to cut the plane up into, into garbage, up into pieces of scrap metal, you know, those beautiful planes. Now, to me, that is villainy of an order that I despise right to the bottom of my soul. Douglas Fisher, a newly elected member of parliament then recalls that when it happened, the destruction of the planes didn't strike anyone as suspicious or sinister. The government thought it best that the, uh, the, uh, the production lines had gone so far that they, they should be destroyed for security reasons. I didn't think very much of it at the time. It wasn't until later that kind of the stupidity of that and the wonder of it began to seep in. And when I say after considerable time, I'm talking about a couple of years, but it didn't create the outrage at the time that it has created since. 
I want to be rid of these infernal airplanes. The sooner this is done, the sooner everyone will forget about them. Jack Granitstein agrees with the movie's thesis, Diefenbaker's loathing of the whole project. It is frankly simply inconceivable. It makes no sense at all. Uh, the only explanation I can come up with is that Diefenbaker had come to despise Crawford Gordon and uh, of Avro so much by this point that in a sheer fit of spite, he ordered the destruction of of the the uh, prototypes and the and the de the uh, data. It makes no sense at all. North American Aviation. We've got a job for you, California. As the movie chronicles, many Arrow engineers and technicians did go south to seek their future in the American space program. But did killing the Arrow also kill Canada's aircraft industry? To say that uh, the end of uh, Arrow and Avro was the end of uh, aeronautics in Canada is of course not true. In fact, today it's a very, seems to be a rather healthy situation. Canada doesn't make its own fighters anymore, but it's still in the aircraft business. One study says Canada has the sixth largest aerospace industry in the world. Only last summer, Bombardier unveiled its new business jet only a few kilometers from the hangar where the first arrow was rolled out. But for Canadians, the arrow remains an enduring mystery of what might have been, a proclamation of our independence. But was that might have been a fond hope for pure myth? It's got the idealism that great stories have, the Homeric Odyssey. It's got that about it. It's got wonderful characters in it. It's got bad guys. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's got romance. It's got a great country behind it. I think that's why it's endearing. <laughs> Regretfully, I think planes should be in the heads rather than in the hearts. It's, it's, it's probably more useful. No, I don't think it has any redeeming feature. I mean, uh, $400 uh, million dollars was a, a large number of money. Now, presumably one should consider, could it have been used in a more productive way? For the National, I'm Dan B. Arneson. Okay, let us put this history chapter in some sort of context. And to help us is Tom McSorley. He is the director of the Canadian Film Institute in Ottawa. Mary Young Lecky is the co-producer of the CBC miniseries, The Arrow. And Stuart Smith is the former head of the Science Council of Canada. And he runs a uh, environmental company which is based in, in Hamilton. I have been reading a lot since, uh, since the mi miniseries. Was this a defining moment, a loss of innocence? So many people say this was the turning point where we became a submissive nation lacking in knowledge, courage, and foresight. Well, I think that's an exaggeration. I think this was a technological achievement, uh, which was an opportunity for Canadians to take pride in our technological ability, an opportunity that was lost. Having said that, however, many other opportunities have since arisen, um, and a technological success can often be a commercial failure. I don't think government now would be allowed to spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, which would be the equivalent now, uh, to chase something which was technologically advanced unless there was a certainty of a market for the product. But, Tom, you're one of the people who see this as some kind of a, a noble defeat that mm -hmm. was a... And, and you've characterized it as a, as a defeat for us as a nation. In a sense, a, in the, as an emerging modern nation in the post-war period, Canada was, as we all remember, a colony of Europe, primarily England and France. And after, I think this is the real rupture, the moment of rupture in 20th century history for Canada is the arrow in a kind of physical and metaphorical sense, uh, that we became, you know, the, the, the satellite, if you will, a big one and an important one, but nevertheless um, a colonial or a colony, rather, of the United States. I think that there's... There are elements to that that I think resonate in the drama in particular because there is a sense of a betrayal of a particular kind of idealism, whether it's nationalistic, technological, uh, or even economic. Um, there is a kind of betrayal and I think a kind of uh, a di a diminution of Canada as a nation in this moment. And it, it really does ask a lot of questions. That whole Arrow story does ask a lot of questions about who we are today and what we want to achieve, doesn't it? Absolutely, and I think my industry base is is a crossover industry because it's cultural as well as a, as commercial 
And so for me as a filmmaker, the Arrow story has great resonance about the, the, our reach and whether or not as filmmakers um, trying to break into an international market as we're trying to do with the product, the Arrow miniseries, can we now take that product, is it good enough for the rest of the world to watch and want to buy? And can we then do more product like that? But that, that lapses into a lot of other areas too. Why well, is it we have, over. <laughs> well, we have We have trouble celebrating and, and, su and supporting our own. Are we always, have we always been, or will we always been just providers of, of resources? Well, Canadians are very modest and yet very inventive. The fact is that uh, I see Canadian technology every day out in the business world and much of it is well in advance of anything else that exists in the world. But we as a nation, Morley Callahan once said to me that the thing he likes most about Canada, obviously before he died, was the fact that we were so modest as a nation. And yet you sometimes wonder if we'll lose our nationhood because of that modesty. Still, commerce is commerce. And nowadays, you have a global economy. The arrow, if it existed today, would have been put into a kind of consortium, like an Airbus consortium where several countries would have got together, established a market for it, each taken a certain fraction of the jobs, and each put in a certain amount of the capital. Uh, it would have been both private and public sector. It wouldn't have been so much the government putting in the money. But that was 40 years ago. Such consortia did not exist. I think today things would be done differently. Well, would they be done differently? Or is it just a lack of will, a lack of foresight, an inability to 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 sell is that just part of our modesty i'm afraid that that inferiority and modesty is not the phrase that i use to describe what happened with the arrow or what happens with many of our other industries i'm afraid that canadians tend to eat their young and that when we get too big and too strong and when we start to really take off that's when the long knives come out and that's the message as filmmakers that we want to make sure gets across. We have to protect the dreamers. We will not have an industrial base. We won't have anything for the bankers to bank or the companies to manufacture if we don't protect the R&D. That's the stage we were at when the era was shut down. We didn't have buyers yet because we were still testing a product. And we had the legs cut out from under us before we had a chance to go out with that product and sell it around the world. And it's important to, just to follow up on that, it's very important to, to remember that you know, economics works in complex ways and that the government of Canada at the time had already invested millions and millions of dollars in this project. And to, you know, the government is always being accused of wasting money. Well, what greater waste can there be than abandoning a project just before it's about to be released on the world? I mean, that is, that's political stupidity. Um, I think that this film, in a, in, a, in a very dramatic way, it's interesting you mentioned eating the young. The film reminded me of the great Goya painting of Saturn devouring his children when I saw it, particularly in this incredible moment when the plane is physically dismembered and carted what off. What do we so, learn from our lessons? Is it still not important to understand where we are in the larger context of, of the world we are, after all, not the shuttle where they cannot arm? Well, the fact is that we can't do scientific mega-projects on our own. Uh, BC wanted a K-on factory, which would have been of great interest to particle physicists, but really not of commercial interest. If we're going to do scientific mega-projects, even the United States has trouble doing them alone nowadays. You have to get together with other countries. You must establish a market. You must have viable companies that will then carry that product. For government to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in R&D, which allegedly leads to a product, in advance of establishing a market for that product is just not on. There isn't that kind of government money available. There never will be again, and countries can't go it alone. Is that why there is a, a, such a, a romantic, nostalgic appeal surrounding the arrow? Because it really does evoke another time when we were allowed to dream dreams and we were permitted to celebrate nationhood. I think this is the start of the, the, the swing back toward a, a new kind of dreaming and a new uh, a new energy to begin to dream again. It is a, a film which argues that one, one has to, I think, fight for one's vision, and that will involve risk, that will involve... We always hear about how risks must be taken uh, in, in the world of business. Well, um, we have to do more about that. We can't simply say we can't do that because it's not on this in, in the late 20th century. We have to be able to do it, and I think to participate in global consortia, you have to be an equal partner and not a colonial um, figure. It sounds good, but I mean, is it not a little fanciful? Well, I think it is a little fanciful. I think uh, you can invest a certain amount of money to build up national pride. And certainly technological achievement is a very good way to build national pride, and I'm all for it. 
But you have to have commercial success at the end or you have not justified the investment. Governments are not wise as business people and investors and therefore they have to work in partnership with the private sector and the private sector is market oriented. The way you refer to it is there must be pull from the market, not just push from the technology. Uh, the other thing we have to recognize is that Canadian technology, uh, while being the best in the world in many areas, didn't suddenly come to a, a stop with the end of, of the arrow, but still requires that there be marketplaces. In Malton, where A.V. Rowe was, while many of the best people were lost, others ended up setting up small businesses. And these businesses in Malton have prospered since then. Many ended up in the auto parts industry, which became the basis for the Auto Pact, which is now the, 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 the main linchpin of our manufacturing industry. I would like to know what do you think it would cost this nation if we don't, if we don't pay for our dreamers, but I want to take a, a short commercial break. We'll be right back and can continue our discussion after this. With me are Tom McSorley, Stuart Smith, and Mary Young Leckie. Do you worry that what will happen to this country, this nation, if we don't support our dreamers, and can we afford to anymore? Well, we, of course we can afford to. I think it, it's, um, I mean, we invest, I mean, this, these, these buzzwords that we hear all the time, uh, culture, dreams, all of these kinds of things which can filter down and become products and be marketed and sold, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are take investment. I mean, I think that there's a, we have to look at time in a different way. This is a long arc here. Harold Innes once said uh, in a wonderful kind of, kind of encapsulation of this that, that public funding has provided a literate public for the newspaper industry to make a lot of money for a few individuals. So if you think about the economy that way, uh, in the sense that we're all in this together and that dreams will become, some will fall by the wayside, others won't. But to invest now and to encourage the dream is the key. And it's not a wishy-washy kind of position. It's a very um, hard It may not be a wishy-washy position, but isn't it, it's a lot, it's wishful thinking position. What the arrow also had to do with was a sense of national pride. You too were annoyed and upset. And that is, isn't that part of the problem, a vision, a uh, 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 pride in nationhood. A vision for the country. There's a character in the arrow who stands up and says, are we going to be a country here, gentlemen? Are we going to be the 51st state? And the only way we can continue to be a country and get even bigger and better into the 21st century is to have the kinds of dreams that are as big as the arrow or bigger. And our businessmen can get behind them and sell them and our bankers can make interest from them and we can prove ourselves internationally, whether it's aviation, whether it's the automobile industry, whether it's the film business or the music industry. We have to be able to give the young people the, the word, the message that they can do it. But the taxpayers will not put billions into building national pride. Uh, a Donovan Bailey is a wonderful thing but you would not put billions into guaranteeing that he wins a gold medal. There are limits to how much the taxpayers are willing to pay for, and that's why we have to be a little more ingenious nowadays in setting up partnerships, consortia, bringing the private and public sector together. But when we're not even sure how we see ourselves as a nation, as a country... Hmm? I think we're sure. If you see the reaction to this show, we're very sure how Canadians see themselves. They see themselves with pride, and enthusiasm. And that arrow has become a symbol for the beauty of this country and the imagination of this country. Canadians have no doubt how they see themselves. They're just trying to find a way to export it to the rest of the world. I thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Stay with us. Peter Mansbridge will be back with some program notes after this.